Is evolution a religion? Yes, and I'll tell you why. Number one, its followers believe that it can violate the first and second laws of thermodynamics. That's right, Eric. Scientists are just so stupid that they came up with a theory that contradicts a well-established and previously known law. Let's do a little recap of thermodynamics, shall we? The zeroth law of thermodynamics says that if two objects are at thermal equilibrium, that is, they each have the same temperature, and they're brought into contact, no heat will flow between them. Incidentally, if two objects are brought together that are not in thermal equilibrium, heat will flow from the hot object to the cold object until they reach thermal equilibrium. The first law of thermodynamics is simply conservation of energy, that is, energy cannot be created or destroyed. How this applies to biological evolution, which is the definition of evolution, I have no idea, but I assume that Eric is yet again trying to stretch the definition of evolution to include the Big Bang, origin of the universe, which I won't address in this video because it's not evolution. Now let's take a look at the second law of thermodynamics, that of entropy. Here we see a basic heat engine. This is a closed system that has a hot reservoir feeding into a cold reservoir, with work being done in the process. This closed system is a perfect illustration of how entropy works. As time increases, the temperatures will eventually balance out, and it's this transfer of heat and this eventual uniformity that increases entropy. Eventually, the cold and hot reservoir will be the same temperature. This is what's known as heat death, and at this point no work can be done and we have full entropy of the system. However, if we add energy from an outside source, this restores the temperature difference and decreases the entropy of the system. The result being that while this system has a local decrease in entropy, the total universal entropy increases because of the transfer of heat from the outside to the system. One example of this kind of decrease in entropy can be seen in your kitchen. When water freezes, its molecules become highly ordered into a crystalline structure. This is a local decrease in entropy. However, the total universal entropy increases as heat is released into the universe as you freeze the ice cube. This is yet another example of how an energy introduced from outside the local system can decrease the entropy of the local system at the cost of increasing the total entropy of the closed system that is the surrounding universe. In the same way that we would decrease the entropy of an ice cube, so too does the entropy of the Earth decrease as energy is fed into it from the sun. And while I am thoroughly disinclined to use Star Trek, let alone Star Trek Voyager, to illustrate a scientific concept, this clip does a very good job of illustrating entropy. I'm not detecting any gases, stellar bodies, or matter of any kind. The anomaly is a closed structure encased by an inert layer of subspace. Matter and energy can't penetrate it. Our ship certainly penetrated it when we were pulled in. By the funnels. But they only pull matter in one direction. Into the void. The only source of food and energy in the void comes from new ships that are drawn in. If you want to survive here, you'll have to compete for their resources. Except for the funnels, the void is a closed system. The reason anything can survive inside the void is because of the inflow of new ships, which are analogous to our sun, supplying the energy needed to prevent heat death. With each new ship that enters the void, the local entropy of the void is decreased, and it's this kind of local decrease in entropy that is evolution. They give godlike properties, godlike properties to time, space, and matter. As you may have guessed, he's again leading into cosmology as well as biological evolution. But for right now, I'll focus on biological evolution because this idea seems to be a very popular creationist straw man. In terms of biological evolution, the godlike property of time is that of diversifying life. That really is the case. The frog can eventually turn into the prince. You just got to give it a long period of time. And somehow, 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 this thing that is impossible actually becomes possible. Time is in fact the hero of the plot. I love this part. Listen carefully. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, the probable virtually certain, one has to only wait because time itself performs miracles. Do you get it? I believe in a three-word entity called God. Christopher Hitchens believes in a four-word entity called time. The essence of evolutionary theory, which is undeniable, is that if you give enough time, this is all going to happen. There is a limit to the rate of change of the DNA. So you need time. Yeah. Time is your God. No. Time is the creator.
No, Ray, time is not the creator. To use your terminology, gene duplication and natural selection are the creator. But time itself is no god. Time is simply what allows a slow, gradual process to yield large results. Filling a sandbox grain by grain, and then giving the person doing it a lot of time to work, and eventually having them complete it, is not miraculous. The same can be said for evolution. However, the reasons that creationists seem to peg time as performing miracles is because it seems to allow the proposed roadblocks of macro-evolution to disappear. While no such roadblocks actually exist, as I will demonstrate, the ones most commonly cited by creationists are that mutations are always harmful, no new information is added, and we've never seen an animal produce another kind of animal. Let's address these in the order presented, shall we? Aaron Ra, you're on. Creationists insist that mutations are very rare and usually, if not always, harmful. But the fact is that the vast majority of mutations are completely neutral. They'd have to be, because according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, there is an overall average of 128 mutations per human zygote. So apparently, in creationist terms, very rare means more than 100 per person right from the point of conception. Because those are just the mutations we start out with. Our cells will mutate again 30 more times over the course of our lives, and some of those subsequent mutations can be passed on to our children too, usually with no more effect than those we recognize as family traits. It's hard to find one rigid set of numbers from any laboratory for a constant rate of how many mutations are beneficial versus those that are detrimental because those are determined by variable environmental conditions. But there is a general consensus that they're nearly equal, with deleterious mutations being slightly more common. They're also more profound, too. But there are plenty of cases where a definite advantage has been identified and positively linked to a specific mutation. Kinfolk in the village of Lamun Salgarda in northern Italy have a mutation which gives them higher tolerance to HDL serum cholesterol. Consequently, this family has no history of heart attacks despite their high-risk dietary habits. This mutation was traced to a single common ancestor living in the 1700s, but has now spread to dozens of descendants. Genetic samples from this family are now being tested for potential treatment for patients of heart disease. Another example of that is the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. About 10% of whites of European origin now carry it, but the incidence is only 2% in Central Asia, and it is completely absent among East Asians, Africans, and tribal Americans. It appears to have suddenly become relatively common among white Europeans about 700 years ago, evidently as a result of the Black Plague, indicating another example of natural selection allowing one gene dominance in a changing environment. It is harmless or neutral in every respect other than its one clearly beneficial feature. According to ScienceFrontiers.com, if one inherits this gene from both parents, they will be especially resistant, if not immune, to AIDS. For another example, we've identified an emerging population of tetrachromatic women who can see a bit of the normally invisible ultraviolet spectrum. There's also a family in Germany who were already unusually strong, but in one case, one of their children was born with a double copy of an antimyostatin mutation carried by both parents. The result is a Herculean kiddo who was examined at only four days old for his unusually well-developed muscles. By four years old, he had twice the muscle mass of normal children and half the fat. Pharmaceutical synthesis of this mutation is being examined for potential use against muscular dystrophy or sarcopenia. Now let's move on to the claim that no new information is added. The simple answer is, yes it is. One of the ways that this can happen is that a gene is duplicated, and then a mutation occurs in the duplicated section of DNA. This can result in what is called a frameshift mutation. But what is a frameshift mutation? When a cell is making a protein, every three bases are read as a unit called a codon, and each codon codes for a different amino acid. These amino acids are then assembled in the order they are coded in the DNA to make a specific protein. For example, CGA codes for arginine, while GAA codes for glutamine, etc. A frameshift mutation occurs when a letter of DNA, a nitrogenous base, gets randomly inserted into a gene. This has the effect of shifting the entire reading frame and making the gene code for different amino acids in a different order and thereby creating a new protein that did not exist before. One example of this is the gene nylonase. The frameshift mutation shown here is actually the one that allowed a species of flavobacteria to now consume nylon for energy. Not only did this add new genetic information, but it was also a beneficial mutation like the ones discussed earlier. Now, this is simply adding new nucleotides, not necessarily new information. However, meaningful information can arise through purely natural processes.